Okay, uh, our next speaker is Ken Robeson. He's a native Montanan, historian at the Overholster Historical Research Center in Fort Benton, Great Falls Cascade County Historic Preservation Commission. He's author of Montana Territory in the Civil War, Frontier Four Forged on the Battlefield, Life and Death on the Upper Missouri, The Frontier Sketches of Johnny Healy, Cascade County and Great Falls, and Fort Benton. Ken is a retired Navy captain after a career in naval intelligence. The Montana Historical Society honored him as Montana Heritage Keeper in 2010. Ken Robeson. Well, we've, we've, is this uh, all the way in the back? I guess you really have to hold it close. Can I switch to that other one? I don't want to swallow it. <laughs> this is better? Yeah. I don't have to eat it to be heard. Well, when the conference set in 2014, in the midst of all these sesquicentennials, I thought it might be a, a useful context as we talk about the Mullen Road to bring the other really big factors that we're celebrating 150 anniversaries of into play. Of course, we're in the middle of the four-year Civil War sesquicentennial, but as Ken Egan very nicely emphasized we're also in the middle of the 150th anniversary of the formation of Montana Territory. And I think we do best to under understand the context of all three of these events with the Mullen Road in 1860, the commencement of the Civil War 61, and the formation of the new territories on the upper Missouri and the northwest being Idaho, Dakota and Montana territories, all formed in a rapid succession, accelerated by the discovery of gold, but driven by the Civil War and Lincoln's war policies. All these events are interwoven, and what I'd like to uh, spend a few moments with you today is looking into how interwoven they really were. The remarkable summer of 1860 provided the prelude to all this. Discovery of gold on the Clearwater in then Washington Territory sparked a rush to the region. Fort Walla Walla was the hub. At that time, Washington Territory, shown in green, as I'm sure most of you know, was, uh, was huge. Also huge was the, the great white to the east that was uh, still part of Nebraska Territory. East of the Continental Divide, Fort Benton was the hub. Steamboats arrived at the head of navigation for the first time in July 1860. These steamboats brought Major George A. H. Blake and his 300 first dragoons to become the first, first and last, for that matter, military uh, users of the wagon road. Shortly after their arrival, Captain William Reynolds and his Army Topographic Survey Expedition, after spending the previous year in the Yellowstone Basin and then wintering in northern Wyoming, came down the, from the confluence of the uh, Missouri River, arrived in Fort Benton also in July. And of course, the arrival of John Mullen on the 4th of August, completed that 624-mile military wagon road building expedition. Nine months later, in April 1861, the Civil War erupted back in the States with profound effect throughout the continent. One month earlier, Dakota Territory had been created encompassing today's Montana east of the divide. When the Civil War began, the Upper Missouri was a vast land of many cultures, as we heard from Julie. 
In addition to the thousands of Native Americans populating the dozen tribes spread through the area, a small number of Americans, Canadians, French, Métis, Spanish, and Mexicans were present, primarily involved in the fur and rope trade. As the Civil War began, at least two of Mullen's men from his military escort, the 3rd Artillery Regiment, resigned their commissions to join the Confederacy. First Lieutenant James Lyon White had commanded the 130-man Mullen military escort, while Second Lieutenant Harlan Benton Lyon served as quartermaster and commissary officer. Both officers were military academy classmates of Mullen, and now they joined the rebellion. Others of Mullen's men followed in the next year or so. And others from the upper Missouri region, like Henry Kennerly, who's shown seated on the right with four or other of the early frontier frontiersmen from the Fort Benton area. He had come, Henry Kennerly had come with that 1855 treaty council negotiation and had uh, accompanied the senior commissioner, Thomas Cummins, Cummins. After the uh, conclusion of the Blackfoot Treaty, which involved other tribes as well, he headed down the Missouri River and yet he came back and spent time between 1855 and, and 1861 in, uh, in the, what later became the Dakota Territories. Well, in 1861, he headed down to return to his home in Missouri to join three of his brothers in the first Missouri Infantry fighting under General Sterling Price leading the Missouri troops that were loyal to the Confederacy. With the, with the May 10th, 1861 Camp Jackson affair at St. Louis, the Civil War erupted in that vital crossroads states of, state of Missouri. Briefly, on the night of May 9th, Union Captain Nathaniel Lyon quietly moved his loyal German immigrant regiments from the St. Louis arsenal to um, surround this area shown here, this Camp Jackson. At the time, the 700 Missouri State Guardsmen with five senior officers, all loyal to the uh, secession, uh, secession movement and and uh, looking to work with Governor Claiborne Pell, uh, Claiborne Jackson of Missouri, to bring Missouri into the Confederacy. Lyon moved his troops in overnight with overwhelming force, and the Missouri State Guardsmen surrendered. Three of the Kennerly brothers were at that camp. All of those prisoners were treated as prisoners of war, even though technically they'd, n there was no declared war, there was no, the, the guardsmen had not formally joined the Confederacy, and yet they treated them like Confederate British prisoners. They were paroled, and uh, one of the fascinating uh, officers, uh, Major Nick Wall, who uh, was the major commissary at Camp Jackson with the Missouri State Guard, uh, came, uh, he, uh, he was paroled to either remain in St. Louis for the duration of the war or to go to the Western Territories, and he opted for the latter. So when that famous Joe LaBarge steamboat Emily that had the veils and, and was loaded with many others uh, departed St. Louis that next spring in, uh, in 1862, Nick Wall was on board as the clerk of the boat Actually, his intention was to, to uh, do that service for Captain LaBarge, and in exchange, when, when the Emily arrived at Fort Benton, Nick Wall would go ashore 
with a big supply of, of uh, goods and head over to the mining camps. Now, it's important to understand when they left St. Louis in the spring of 1862, the miners on board and those uh, passengers thought they were all going over to the, to the uh, Washington, uh, Idaho area, Washington uh, gold mines because word had not gotten back to St. Louis at that point that Gold Creek colors had been struck and by the time they got to Fort Benton and found that out, they uh, used the Mullen Road to go on over to the Gold Creek area rather than continuing on to, to Idaho. The uh, summer of uh, 61, as the Civil War began with a vengeance on the Eastern and Western theaters, Captain Mullen, of course, continued his work. The following year, he, uh, he finalized his, com he completed his Mullen Road building when he arrived in Fort Benton on the 8th of June. That year of 1862 provided a sea change year on the upper Missouri with the gold strikes at Gold Creek. Shortly after, exciting strikes also occurred, of course, at Grasshopper Creek, and the stampede was on to the Montana Placer mines. On the 8th of June, as I mentioned, Mullen returned for the final road building work to uh, Fort Benton. Nine days later, the steamboats Emily and, and uh, Shreveport arrived at the Fort Benton upper levee with 400 passengers. They were loaded to the gills and 600 tons of cargo. If you can imagine these 250 to 300 foot steamboats fighting their way up the Missouri River all the way from St. Louis to Fort Benton. It, it, had to be a sight to behold. The gold rush was on, and of course the road they used was the Mullen Road. On board the Emily was Major Nick Wall, and his, his impact on Montana, although he's still very little known, was immense. Within two years, with Nick Wall operating in Montana and his partners in St. Louis, John J. Groh and uh, Captain uh, John G. Copeland, Rowe's son-in-law, they had formed the most sophisticated, integrated um, transportation system that uh, was operating probably in the whole West at the time because what they were doing with Copeland running the operation were they were running the steamboats from St. Louis up to Fort Benton. With the cargo on board offloaded at Fort Benton, Wall was on the receiving end and had formed what later became the fi famed Diamond R Overland Freighting Company. Wall's uh, wagons, the, the large number of wagons and, and men working for him, um, would take the, go the goods over to the gold camps and at the gold camps like Bannock and then in 63 Virginia City, John J. Rowan Company retail stores would sell the goods. So you had all the way from St. Louis to selling the goods in the, the what was at that time in 63 uh, Idaho Territory, a, a very integrated operation. Meanwhile, in uh, Washington, D.C., during the spring of 1862, with the withdrawal of the southern states from the Union, President Lincoln's Republican Congress passed momentous legislation that would forever change the future of the Western United States. In three amazing months, without Southern obstructionism, Congress passed the Homestead Act, opening millions of acres for future land settlement, the Pacific Railway Act, paving the way for the transcontinental railroads, the Morrell Land Grant College Act, of course, greatly broadening education, and I've got to add here, go Grizz. <laughs> Sorry, Bobcats. There aren't many here, though. How many Bobcats are here? And this is a, there's a handful. Good. And of course, the the fourth piece of very important legislation was the abolition of slavery in Washington D.C. and the uh, Western Territories. 
In addition, the Civil War settled forever, of course, the two fundamental questions. There would be a united, unified United States, and there would no longer be slavery. The Civil War directly impacted every section, every community, every family, and every individual, and those that came west bore their wartime experiences, men, women, and children. The Civil War and the gold accelerated <clears throat> the settlement and formation of Idaho and Montana territories. The extracted gold and other mineral wealth helped to fill the coffers of the federal government, which of course was in need of wartime financing, directly re aiding the war effort. The Lincoln government sought to add new territories as quickly as possible as prospective new loyal states, knowing that eventually the former states of the South would come back in, and, and the Republicans as well as Lincoln knew the more they had uh, entered in the, in the West, the, the better they'd be to balance a returning uh, Southern uh, senator and representative uh, influx. And less than a, a year later, Congress was debating the admission of a new territory to represent the, the Bannock and Virginia City mining camps. This was in the uh, winter leading into the spring of 1864. Idaho promoter J.L. Campbell proposed this monster Idaho territory. However, led by the chairman of the Congressional Territories Committee, James M. Ashley, Montana Territory was named and created uh, a couple weeks from now, 150 years ago, on the 26th of May, 1864. If you saw the, uh, the great movie Lincoln this past year, you might remember that James Ashley led the dramatic effort to pass the 13th Amendment through the House of Representatives. That amendment, which uh, uh, helped, helped uh, legalize what Lincoln had done with the Emancipation Proclamation and what Congress had done in, in their uh, abolition of slavery on a selective basis to a total abolition through a constitutional uh, amendment. And that amendment was passed in the spring, although it didn't take effect until the, uh, the December of 1865. Well, Ashley also uh, gained some uh, notoriety by a couple of years later by leading the impeachment effort against Andrew Johnson, the president that, of course, succeeded uh, Lincoln. And, of course, through that action, he, he, he already was an abolitionist Republican and therefore not very popular with the Democrats, the Northern Democrats. And I should emphasize here, and we don't have time to go into it, but the the politics of the Civil War in the North is pretty involved and fascinating. Simply put, though, the Republicans were relatively united behind Lincoln. They weren't all united between abolitionists and, and, and mild abolitionists. You know, there are varying degrees. But the Democrats were absolutely split down the line. Most of them opposed uh, equal rights for African Americans. However, the war Democrats that included many of the immigrant Irish uh, along with a large number of other northern Democrats um, believed strongly in the Union and they were willing to fight for the Union and therefore they're called war Democrats. The peace Democrats were somewhat mixed among themselves but they were, uh, they were not willing to fight for the war. They wanted the war settled uh, some would go as far as allowing slavery to continue to exist in the South, while others felt that, that uh, the agreement with the South should end in phased out slavery. So, you know, there are a lot of varying degrees. And, of course, this, this guy was caught in the middle uh, after leading the impeachment effort against uh, uh, 
uh, President uh, Johnson that failed by a single vote. He, uh, he had the uh, honor of being nominated by, uh, by General Grant, or President Grant at that point, to come to Montana Territory as the governor. And uh, after a, a long struggle to get him uh, uh, to the job, he uh, spent one year trying to convince uh, a large uh, Democrat population in Montana, many of whom were war Democrats, others were peace Democrats. It didn't make any difference. They all opposed Ashley, and he failed and left the territory within a year. We heard earlier a bit about this man, and that's uh, Sidney Edgerton, and anxious to uh, to free the to uh, admit the free territories that I mentioned earlier was part of Lincoln's policy. Um, Edgerton had been successful in getting the Montana Territory created. He'd been the Chief Justice of Idaho Territory at that point. Went back to Washington, lobbied with Lincoln and Congress and succeeded with Ashley's leadership in getting Montana Territory created. The Civil War was at a critical stage when Montana came into the Union with General Grant applying continuous pressure on General Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia in a series of bloody battles in Central Virginia that began with the wilderness, extended to Spotsylvania, and was just underway at Cold Harbor. The terrible fighting and heavy losses in Virginia weighed heavily on public opinion, and of course, uh, it, that was all leading into the 1864 election, when because of Grant's successes and because of the improved outlook for the Union, uh, President Lincoln was able to turn back uh, and defeat uh, the uh, infamous uh, General McClellan that we heard a bit about earlier. Some of the uh, first eight territorial governors that came to Montana Territory, um, of course, uh, Thomas Francis Marr was not w actually a, a governor sent to Montana Territory. He was sent as uh, he was sent as territorial secretary, and because of a couple of absences of Edgertons and then a new government, uh, a governor that was promoted and named by, uh, by Lincoln, and that was uh, Governor Green, Green Clay Smith, and he had absence as well. Thomas Francis Marr, who most of you know very well, I'm sure, but had uh, led rebellions as a, as a very young man in Ireland, had been condemned to death, been uh, pardoned, not pardoned, but uh, uh, commuted to life uh, exile to Tasmania, managed to escape from there, came to New York in the 1850s, became a very popular lecturer on the uh, Irish question back in uh, the England and, and Ireland. And he also uh, entered the war very early, leading, uh, raising troops and leading uh, immigrant Irishmen in the Irish Brigade. Now. Thomas Francis Marr, his time in Montana has left him with many memories, including this wonderful wartime statue in front of the uh, uh, Montana State Capitol. This was a rededication several years ago in his jubilation tea corn pone pose charging somewhere in Montana for the Civil War. The Civil War dislocated and relocated countless Americans. Some men came into the new Montana Territory to, to escape service and escape the ravages of the war. Some came to, for they all came for opportunity. Some came to chase the elephant, seeking their fortunes. Women and children followed the men arriving by steamboat or wagon into the rough Montana frontier. Shortly after creation of Montana Territory, Governor Edgerton hastily ordered a census that found some 15,800 uh, residents of the new territory and about 11,500 packed in 
uh, Madison County along Alder Gulch. The Civil War affected the, the new Montana territory in many ways. We heard earlier talk about the, uh, <clears throat> about the plumber vigilante encounters. Um, the vigilantes allied with uh, Edgerton acted swiftly during the winter of 1863-64 to hang or drive out the outlaw elements under corrupt, my preferences are known, corrupt uh, Sheriff Henry Plummer. The vigilantes filled the law and order gap until territorial government could be organized. Because of the war, no army troops were available to protect the mining camps and the Mullen and Bozeman roads from raids and incidents with native Indians. Some private civilian armies and a fledgling Montana militia tried to fill the void but proved inadequate. Calls for army permanent presence in the new territory led to armed shipments, but no troops were available until after the war. Ironically, the first soldiers to be stationed in Montana were ex-Confederate soldiers called galvanized Yankees. These were Confederates captured by Union forces who chose to enlist for frontier service rather than remain in prisoner of war camps. On May 12, 1865, First Lieutenant Horace S. Hutchins of Company H, 1st U.S. Volunteer Militia, and nine men embarked the steamboat Deer Lodge at Fort Rice, Dakota Territory, under orders from their commander to, quote, control the trade with Indians between Fort Benton and Fort Union. The Deer Lodge arrived at Fort Benton on May 30th, and the soldiers remained there during the summer to provide transportation security. Here in a new sketch by artist David Parchin of Fort Benton, uh, the camp is set up just on the north side of the trading post of uh, Fort Benton. And um, this, uh, this galvanized Yankee group, they, they eventually raised six regiments and it took, you know, it relieved six Union residents to go back to uh, fight in the war. The monumental Civil War had ended. Montana Territory was struggling into existence and as far as the Mullen Road, portions of it had worked, but just barely. Some better than others. Um, for instance, the uh, portion along uh, eastern, the eastern segment uh, evolved with the great quantity of goods and passengers arriving on the steamboats in that 1860s era, it evolved rapidly into what was called the Montana's Benton Road, and Lee Hanchett has a very fine book out on that. But it took civilian um, efforts to make the improvements that were needed, for instance, through Prickly Pear and portions of that eastern segment. And King and Gillette and other creative pioneers took the Mullen Road far beyond where Mullen and his government money had left it, all the way to today's railroads and highways. And I'd add here a couple of uh, additional things. Let me check the time. I'm almost out of time, but I, I will say that uh, in, uh, in my uh, life and death on the upper Missouri, the stories of uh, Johnny Healy, there's a wonderful account of Healy's of the burning of the Blackfoot community or Blackfoot uh, government farm two years after Ken's incident there and his uh, 1864 uh, period. In 1866, it was attacked and burned. Actually, it blew up because it was storing dynamite for the Diamond R. Uh, and uh, in the fires that the Blackfoot raiding party lit, it, uh, it overwhelmed the, uh, the uh, building and it, it blew up. I'd also mention uh, that I've got uh, brochures I'll be glad to hand out later, but in May and June of this year, starting now, uh, on the 8th of May, we'll have a series of 10 events in Great Falls that commemorate Montana Territory and the Civil War. And they range from things, the first event is uh, 
very appropriately African Americans, the Civil War through African American eyes. And uh, other events will be things like uh, um, descendants bringing their, their treasures from Civil War ancestors, photos, diaries, uh, letters and so on in for a kind of a show and tell and a discussion of doing research on Civil War ancestors. Other events are uh, literature, music and so on. A couple of uh, fun events are going to be uh, reenactor groups. The first Montana formed uh, Civil War reenactment group, the first appropriately, the first U.S. Volunteer Infantry will set up an encampment in Library Park in Great Falls and on the 31st of May for six hours during that Saturday afternoon they'll be in camp and have formations and be firing their their rifles and so on. We also have another couple of enactments. Uh, Clara Barton uh, who lives in uh, Laurel, did, did you know? <laughs> and, uh, and her husband who's going to be uh, playing a union officer will be there at another event. So there's a whole series of events uh, whether you can come over to Great Falls Ad or not, you're welcome to pick up a, a, a brochure. I've got a good number of them here. So thank you very much. And welcome to Fort Benton next year. Our next speaker is a staple at these events year after year and um, a Missoula guy and a bobcat. I should add. Anna Grizzly. Grizzly, okay. <laughs> Went to engineering school, I believe, in Bozeman, correct? Um, Bill Weichel's mostly retired professional land surveyor and engineer with in excess of 40 years in the professions. In the mid-1990s, he began researching the Mullen Military Wagon Road, and his professional background offered him a unique insight into the equipment and methods that were being used for mapping of the road and using historic maps and field evidence to determine the probable location of the original road. He has obtained a significant collection of historic surveying, measuring and mapping equipment, including items that are characteristic of those that would have used would have been used during construction of the road. He's provided numerous presentations to a variety of groups about the equipment and methods used by the persons under the command of John Mullen. Those of you who have been out on the road with him probably know him as the no-no man. <laughs> Every, most places where we think the road is, <laughs> no. And he's usually right. But boy, when he agrees with you, it's the best feeling in the world. <laughs> Yeah, we had one of those agreements the other day out on uh, the west side of Medicine Tree Hill. Uh, and that doesn't happen often. Anyhow, I got to get my clock out here because it's in case nobody else keeps time on me. Uh, anyhow, my talk is about uh, mapping the Mullen military wagon road and subsequent road changes. I address it that way rather than calling it mapping the Fort Walla Walla and Fort Benton military wagon road. It's too long, but that, in, that technically is the name of the road. That, that appeared on the maps of the, uh, of the report. Okay, for those of you who do not know, the first, the first route was 1859 to 1860. Started down here in Fort Walla Walla, went up through the south side of Coeur d'Alene Lake, come over over the mountains, down the St. Regis River, through the Missoula area, or up the Clark Fork through the Missoula area, uh, over into the Deer Lodge Valley, uh, back into the Helena area, and on up to Fort Benton. We, we, when, when, you, when you think about how the road, what, the, that it was an engineered road. I always hear everybody say, John Mullen engineered a road. Well, very little of it was actual engineering. It was, it was deciding, I guess, you know, that we're going to go this direction. And when you're in open country, there, where there's no construction to take place, I call it first wagon winds. You know, we're heading in from the Frenchtown Valley, and we can see the, uh, the Hellgate Canyon. 
we're heading toward the Hellgate Canyon. Maybe somebody's out there a couple miles ahead with a white flag that says, no, you got to go over this way a ways. And so we go over that, we start going that way. And that's, you know, makes the wagon track. Uh, at stream crossings, whoops, excuse me. At stream crossings, earth was moved to allow the road to get in and out of the stream. If they had a bank that you couldn't get down, you had to, some, you had to do some carving. Uh, where it was located through timber country, sometimes, like the one we saw in Medicine Tree Hill the other day, they just wove around the trees. Some areas, I believe, like in, over in the Wallace Kellogg area, they cut trees down as low as they could get them and straddled them, uh, and in some cases took the stumps out. Uh, some areas it was necessary to perform extensive excavation or fill work when there was no route through reasonably level ground. So that's the areas like the big side cut and like the three mile grade that we'll see tomorrow. Okay. As, as the road was located constructed, they, uh, they, they had a crew that followed behind the wagons and made measurements of the road alignment. Uh, in some cases, the road elevation and then a lot of features alongside the road. I list there the various tools that they had, which is kind of what I've got up on the table here if you've looked ahead of time to see that. Uh, one of the things that they had to do, excuse me, they got, they got lat latitude and longitude locations at some, uh, five or six spots to where they could leave a crew there for a long time, take a lot of celestial observations, and determine a, a fairly reasonable degree of accuracy of what the location, latitude, and longitude of that particular spot was. You know, in that time period, uh, de a degree of accuracy of one mile in latitude was feasible, and a de degree, of, or degree of accuracy of 10 miles in longitude was feasible. To determine those, they used a sextant uh, along with an artificial horizon. I won't go through the, how to, you know, the, the, the mechanics of how that works, but through observation of the sun and stars, you could, and then some uh, calculation gyrations, you could determine reasonably close of where you were at latitude and longitude. Along with that, they had, to have a, they had a clock chronometer, which uh, they needed for longitude to determine the time locally in comparison to the time at some known uh, latitude, or excuse me, some known longitude. I feel like I'm almost worn out today from walking around. I should have started talking first thing this morning. <laughs> okay, in between those pieces of, or those spots of known latitude, longitude, they ran course and distance uh, measurements. So, like this is a, a drawing of a stretch of the road somewhere out in the Alberton area, I believe. And they have these stations along the road this is, I think, I can't quite tell, but 31, maybe 32. And basically, they weren't, they, they weren't mapping every little nuance in the road. They were mapping from point to point that they could reasonably measure a distance of and get a direction between two points. So in this case, they're getting a direction and distance from here to here, but they're drawing it that they've actually got a kind of little, little loop in the road there. They're determining those directions with either a compass. Uh, this is an early uh, vein compass, I call it. Uh, it's actually, it's a surveyor's compass. Uh, I think was maybe the proper terminology. Or they were using a transit. They had both. The transit, again, had a compass in it. In this, in this area here, had a compass. But you could also turn angles if you wanted to, whereas you couldn't really do that with the compass. 
So they would, using either one of those instruments, they would be, ter be determining a direction of the roadway from point to, you know, selected point to point. They measured the distance using a wagon wheel odometer or revolution counter. Um, I'm not sure exactly whether this was the type they used. This particular one, I believe, dates from that time period. Uh, but they, had, they, they, they address in the report that they did have some sort of a, and a wagon wheel odometer. And the way this thing operated, this is a picture in Yellowstone Park during Jackson's survey of Yellowstone Park. And you can see this little thing right there. That is essentially this canister inside of a leather case, and it's strapped to a wagon wheel. I'll show you just in general how this thing would work. This thing sat inside of a case. This thing was inside of a case, and it's got a dial on here, and then it's got a fixed worm screw here. So as, no matter where that case was at on the wheel, as the wheel went around, that, would not, that, that counter would hang down, and that gear would turn against the worm screw, and it would count the revolutions. And so what you would do is, you, at the beginning of one of these courses, you would have a reading on here, and at the end you would have a reading, and then I'll show it that one. So anyhow, they, they may have had something like this. This was much more desirable to measure with than a four, than a four wheel device. Because like this, where they're going through Yellowstone Park, is they, this horse can step over limbs and that two-wheel cart can go right over the limbs, logs laying on the ground, and you can still be reading. You're not going to be as accurate as you would, but it will still read. Okay. They created charts like this. This is actually taken from uh, one of their sets of field notes. Uh, rather than the way rather than at the end of each time where they got the number of revolutions, sitting down and multiplying the circumference of the wagon wheel by the number of revolutions, they would take the wagon wheel ahead of time and they'd set up a table to where you had one revolution was 10 feet 11 inches, two is 21 10, et cetera. You go all the way through to 100 and then you jump to 145 is 3 tenths of a mile, 194 is 4, et cetera, et cetera. And so by doing all of that ahead of time, then as they went along and they got their, uh, their revolution count, they could go to the table, get a number. They might be in their notebooks. They might be plotting it at one inch to the mile scale. And so they could actually start draw it as they went along. They could draw the alignment, uh, which as a surveyor, that's the best way to do it rather than just collecting data in the field and then coming back and trying to interpret it when you get into the office. As they went along mapping alongside the road, so here we are, we're following the road and we've got all these angles. Okay, and each one of these has a, is a course and a distance. Well, we plot that out and as we come to, let's say right here, okay, we see the tip of this island out in the river and so we get a compass direction to it or an angle off of this line and then when we get down to this one, we can see that same point again. And so we take another compass direction. And because we've got this plotted to scale, we can plot those angles and get the position of the end of that island. You know, we could also do mountain peaks. And so there's, there's some stuff that you see where they've, they've essentially physically located on their maps. You'll see all these mountain peaks. And these, contrary to Dan McDermott here, these mountain peaks, they didn't go all out, out, out to all the top of all of those and try to locate them. 
They were locating them by, by angular measurement, simple trigonometry. They recorded their data in a sheet like this. this these were actually, these were pre-printed sheets. They had all of this, all these headings on it. They were pre-printed sheets from somewhere back east, and they brought them out, and, and that's what they worked with. And so they would record in here, okay, those stations numbers. So we're at two, station 218. We've got a dominant reading of 2524. Okay, and the next one we've got 2695. So we've got 171 revolutions of the wagon wheel in that course. We went 0.2 miles. And in this case, the course, they're working off of azimuth, which is a, a degrees right from north. In this case, that's a north azimuth. And so they're going essentially north 35 east. They're on gentle rise. They're 60 yards from water. Left end of an island bears 351, which is north 9 degrees west. So they're recording all of this data and they're go as they're going on. And then maybe on the other side of the page, they're drawing it. You know, so that they've got, yes? Where did you see those sheets? I've never seen These? In microfilm. Oh, microfilm? It's, it, well, it's on, it, it's in somewhere, it's in their books. You know, it's in the books. And I, and I copied this years ago off of the microfilm that they had, that they had acquired at the University of Montana, you know? Yeah, yeah. And it was hard to read. <laughs> Very hard to read. I mean, it, it, the reality is, is if I could go back and spend 35 years interpreting every one of these pieces of paper like that, I could probably pin down pretty well where stuff went. But that's even to get through one page, like somebody was saying when Stuart was talking about trying to read what John Mullen was saying, is a day a page. Oops, excuse me. Okay, they could also uh, determine height with respect to the to the road of objects in vicinity of the road. Okay, they had done that triangle, and so by their scale, they knew how far this H distance was. So they could turn a vertical angle here with that transit to the top of that peak and get their vertical. You know, all never never happened to leave the roadway. You know, in today's world, I always say that, you know, me being an old time surveyor. If I wanted to know the elevation of the top of Mount Jumbo, I would come down here and I'd set a baseline up somewhere out here and measure the length of that baseline and turn vertical angles to the top of Mount Jumbo and horizontal angles from the two pieces on that baseline. Modern day surveyor would go out there and spend five hours climbing to the top of Mount Jumbo with his GPS. <laughs> right? And it wouldn't gain him much more than what I already had. He or, excuse me, in today's world, that's he or she. Uh, this this is, is a sketch uh, that appears in their, you know, in, in all of these logs. This is a sketch to where they're kind of drawn the mountains, the characteristics of the mountains here. And then these numbers, you can't tell it here, but these numbers are, you know, like 800 feet. 700 feet, 600 feet type of thing, so that they have kind of a, a relationship of how high those mountains are. The primary purpose of doing that is that ultimately they're going to make maps, and those maps, 10 years from now, from then, are going to be discussed with the Department of the Army or somebody planning on a railroad, and they're going to want to know what are we going through. What are we building through? And so that's what they got to be able to go back and do is they've got to be able to create these maps so that you've got a talking points, you know, when you're 3,000 miles and 10 years away. They determined elevations uh, at some spots using a cistern barometer. Uh, there's record of at the top of Sohan's Pass, which is, for those who are not familiar, is south of Lookout Pass going into Idaho. Uh, they set a cistern barometer up here like this for weeks. And they, they took barometric readings every day and then temperature readings. And by meaning all of those out, they could get a reasonable elevation 
of the top of that, uh, of the top of Sohan's Pass. And I've looked at it in, in the old maps, and you know, you don't know exactly where they were on the top of the pass, but record-wise with today's elevations, it's 30, 40 feet of the same elevation. In between, you know, they go, they go to the top of, of Sohan's Pass and they get this precise elevation, so to speak, with all of these repetitive, uh, all these observations. Well, then they could take a, an aneroid barometer and they could take off, they could check it against, on one day against their cistern barometer. They could go down the mountain 20 miles, get a rating there, and then come back at the end of the day and check it and they would have determined a reasonable elevation difference between a number of points, depending on how many they wanted to do. Did they know about magnetic north back then? Oh, yes. <coughs> yes. By all means. The declination were factored in. Well, yeah, they, they, yeah. They, well, I don't know whether they put it in or not as they went. They may have come in later. You know, some compasses, like the one I showed you earlier, some compasses in the time period had the ability to set declinations and some did not. They also had a, had a Y level. Uh, there's, there's a record to where they ran, I think I got, they ran elevations just as Stuart and I, Kurt, would have done 20 years ago using a rod and a level, they ran elevations from the Cataldo Mission up the, whatever that river, I can't remember what it's called, over Sohan's Pass and down to Cantonment, Jordan. And it was basically, if any of you are familiar with the methodology, it's backsight, foresight, backsight, foresight, backsight, foresight, just repetitively setting up the rod and carrying elevations. And I know you can see the difference. I mean, that's a long, 2,400 feet up and, and 1,600 feet back down. But the primary reason for running this is they recognized that if they were going to get a railroad over there, they needed to know what kind of elevation difference they were dealing with and what kind of distance. And if you go on their, some of their maps, and I think you've seen the ones to where they actually have the blue lines and the red lines, but they show the, a, a, a tunnel under the mountain about a two mile long tunnel from the St. Regis River over to the Mullen area. It's further east than Sohan Pass. Right, right, really? right. They really was east of Lookout Pass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So their end product from, from you know, obtaining all this information was these various kinds of maps. They had kind of a, you know, a work map. And so this particular work map is coming through the Missoula area. You can see here, here's, here's a mileage, 361 miles. Uh, for those of you who've been around Missoula forever, you can remember this island before they created Kiris Park. And so they had, they had it sketched in there. Uh, here we go around into East Missoula and then around to Marshall Grade out here. There, there's, there's some maps, some of those that are probably missing, but we've got one series of maps that one inch to a mile that are very good uh, resources for trying to determine where the road might have gone. They created some detailed maps of specific areas. This is over in the Kellogg-Wallace-Mullen area. Uh, I think the, the reason they may have done this that detailed was that that was going to be another tough area to put a railroad through. Okay? In this particular case, I'm showing it up against a Forest Service map and to show how accurate they were. If you look at where I bring these lines down, they're consistent points and I've, I've scaled it. I shrunk the Forest Service map to match the other one or expanded it. But you can see like this feature coming around here. There's the one in the modern map. The only thing that happened is right here, they blew a mile in their, in their measurements. They screwed up a mile when they were creating their drawing. And I can't remember which way it goes. It's probably short because this should be up here to match up with, with these lines. 
And then they drew the large detailed map for their final report. This is the map of the mountain section uh, in our area. So they got the Higgins and Warden store. They got Cantonment Wright out in Bonner. Hugo's Bridge and the Medicine Tree down, which will be at the end of our field trip tomorrow. Uh, and then Mullen Pass. And, and these, you know, when you work with these, these are all resources to try to determine where it is. But this is, you know, where the road is. But this is a scale of one foot equals a million feet. So it's not, <laughs> it's not, you, you can't just blow it up to, to one inch to a mile and be able to overlay something. Okay, so then road changes. Which road? What generation of road are we talking about when we refer to the Mullen Road? This one? Paved section out by Frenchtown, I believe. Gravel section out by Houston. Road cut out, at, out uh, just west of Alberton that was created in, in 1908 when they built the Milwaukee. This one which is a piece we'll walk on uh, tomorrow, or close to what we'll walk on, which was the 1861-1862 three-mile grade construction. Or this one, which is the first thing that ever got me really excited about the Mullen Road, which is a little cut down west of Alberton that was bypassed in 1908. They cut it off when the Milwaukee went through there, and probably until I walked in there one day, nobody had really recognized what, for what it was in, in 80 years, 80, 90 years. Okay. Uh, when, when we're in open country and the wagon's going toward Hellgate Canyon, and they've got a track. Well, the next, you know, and they hit a mud hole, or they hit something that the next wagon isn't going to blindly follow them. They go somewhere new, you know, because it doesn't matter. We own the whole country, and all we do, all we're trying to do is just try to get a, a wagon track between those two forts. Uh, so then, and then again, you know, as, as years went by. You know, say, say a, a wagon traveled through going one direction, and then, and and there was a big bend in the in the in the trail at that time or road at that time, and they looked at it and they said, "God, when I'm coming back through, I'm just going to cut that corner off." You know, I call it the college student theory. And you go on campus every time you put a sidewalk in. The college students cut the corner. Well, you're going to do the same thing with a wagon. You aren't just going to blindly go across just because that's where the previous track went. As long as you know that, you know, you're still going within the same corridor, you make changes. And and at that point in time, especially early on, nobody really cared. You know, nobody owned the land. There hadn't been any homesteaders in yet, so you didn't care. There were new routes constructed in 1861 and 1862. This is the, this right here is the three mile grade that we're going to see tomorrow. Okay, this little thing right here, I'm sorry this is so blurry, but it's off of a half inch to the mile map and it was pretty hard to expand. But, uh, but this little piece right here was probably the first one that they built in 5960 or the fall. The path they followed in 5960, and then this one was the one that they came back and constructed to bypass all of these crossings of the uh, uh, of the Clark Fork River. New routes were created to access new towns. Okay, uh, you can see here. Here they're showing on Mullen on the original maps. They're showing the road right there. There's Bearmouth right there. I think did Sally, is Sally still here? Or did she leave? I think she left. Okay. I I was hoping she'd still be here because, okay, the picture that she showed of the road, the Mullen Road in the, uh, in the Bearmouth area, 
in one of her slides when she was talking about the area going up through there, that was taken right in here. Okay? The original road went right over here. But this, when after Bearmouth was established, which was late 1860s, I believe, well, as soon as Bearmouth's established, any wagon coming is going to divert over here to get some supplies or to stop and check things out. And so they, they abandon this and they start using this. And then also, this became a plowed field, so they moved it over against the edge of the hill. They were moved, moved out of travel route of farmable areas. Okay? Our area that I went down years ago, down by Drummond, I had a fellow, that old, old gentleman down there, that was, took us out and he says, this is the Mullen Road. This has been the Mullen Road since I was a kid. Well, he was a kid in 1910, you know, 50 years after the Mullen Road was constructed. And so you look at it close, and here's where the original road was. It's a nice alluvial, kind of an alluvial fan, nice and uniform down there. But somebody wanted to plow this. Somebody wanted to farm this alluvial fan. So they pushed the road over onto the hillside. And this is all cut. You know, there was no, Mullins wasn't going to cut it. They weren't going to cut if they didn't need to. They were just going to drive. was shifted in 1883 to allow for railroad construction. Okay, it originally went somewhere down in here like this, going out to the east of Missoula. Well, when the railroad came in, railroad didn't, you know, had to have an alignment. And so they didn't want to have the road crossing back and forth over them. And they would just, once they built the railroad, they'd just come down with a wagon along one side or the other and create a new path. You know, because it, at that point, it didn't really matter whether you were on the original path or not. A lot of subdivision overlaid, overlaid the road. In Missoula, probably the first thing that really happened was when they started to lay the town site of Missoula out, the road went through here somewhere. Well, in Front Street, if you look at where the road probably went, Front Street was where they turned off of the road and came down to the Missoula bill, Mills and then turned off, left Missoula Mills and went back to the road out here somewhere. Well, when it come time to lay out a, a town where you had parallel streets, they just kind of abandoned that old road and put in Broadway and Main. You know, again, because it really didn't matter whether, whether they were preserving the original alignment when I ran, it, I ran into this one a couple of years, or last year when I was trying to do a thing for the surveyors conference. When I go to the GLO plats, the road is shown up here where we cross reserve and the current Mullen Road. It's shown right up here. Well, I talked to Mike Flynn from the Flynn, who's a Flynn ditch operator, and he told me about when they constructed this ditch. There's a ditch that goes right along here and then follows the edge of the bank right here in front of Walmart. Well, if I come in here and I homestead this area, and I've got this wagon track out here, and I've got a ditch over here, which forces me into having two places to farm, I'm going to plow the road up and just drive, into, drive a wagon a couple of times in the new area. Yeah. Because it doesn't matter. You know, there's not that much, there's not that many people traveling on it. Sir, yes, sir. Why was the Mullen Monument located near the old Fox Theater? When I came in 1960, there was one of the monuments. Because they stole it out of Bonner and put it down there at Long Front Street because everybody thought Front Street was the old Mullen Road. <laughs> Is that a satisfactory answer? <laughs> or is it a too curt of an answer? <laughs> it was, it, that, that monument that was down at Main Orange in front was the monument that had originally been in Bonner. They moved it into Missoula, and now it's back in Bonner. But they could have put it in a lot of different places in Missoula. No, they couldn't. There was only one piece of land that didn't have a building on it, and that was that little triangle. <laughs> There are changes done in 1908 with the, with the uh, 
construction of the, the Milwaukee. Uh, that piece that I showed early on of the little thing through the rock cut uh, is, I think, right here. And the Milwaukee came through and cut that off. And so they rerouted the road and came up through here. You know, again, I, I mean, if any of you ever studied railroad, there's not many, in those days, there wasn't many rules with railroad. They won all the time, whether it be a river, a road, or anything, they won. So yeah, so there's, there's a change that was made by the Milwaukee. And the Milwaukee, when they were doing this, they had big crews, and they had, I think when we first went up and looked at this, there was, there was about uh, 20 black powder cans sitting right there. You know, old rusted out black powder cans that they'd use to blast some of this stuff out of here. There were new routes that were created to, uh, for car traffic. You know, a lot of, I think, uh, when we were talking about the steepness of the Mullen, uh, of the, the wagon road, uh, cars, the early cars, the only way they're going up that is backwards because they had no fuel pumps. And so they had to, they'd have to turn around and back up it and, and oft times it might be too steep for them. And so you'd get places to where you know, you change the route. Ooh, you change the route in order to accommodate car traffic. So, like this, uh, this is showing the, the road over Camel's Hump, which, those of you who aren't familiar, is kind of to the northwest of St. Regis. Okay, and so this is an estimate of where the old road was. And then here's where the road is now. It goes in and out all these draws in order to maintain a grade that a car can travel. Because they, could, they couldn't come up, especially like right here. This is a, we've been out and kind of looked at where this is, and that's a very steep grade. But a wagon could do it by double teaming. And then coming down, they could chain drag, or they could, they could log drag, or they could chain lock. In the later dates, I don't have anything to illustrate this, but when they started making paved roads and they started having equipment that could cut and fill to, uh, to you know, in, in a much easier fashion than in the old days, then they started, you know, and they're starting to work with cars, they just straighten them out. And sometimes they might buy right away at that point, but you don't, it, it's hard to even find the record of what that right away might have been. So in my opinion, it's likely there are a few places where the center line of an exist any existing traveled way coincides with the center line of the or original Mullen or military wagon road. That just, you know, there, there is too many things that transpired over the years to where, you know, it all follows the same corridor, but it doesn't follow the tread. But there are a few places like we've, we've seen, I, I've probably in the 20 years I've been around this, I've seen maybe four miles that we can confirm were probably the last thing that went over them could have been a wagon. When two wagons met one another, what was the rule of the road? <laughs> Biggest gun wins, I suppose. <laughs> I don't know, Jim. I don't think they record that stuff in history all the time. <laughs> they didn't have pullouts. <laughs> Not what? Not on the mountain sections. No, I think somebody was telling us that earlier, was talking about taking the wagon. Jim was telling us about taking the wagons apart. When they met on the top of the big side cut, neither one of them was going to be able to back up. And so they'd take the wagon apart and throw it up on the hillside and unload everything, put the wagon up on the hillside, pull one through, drag it back down, and put the wagon back together. <laughs> yeah, the smallest one with the less load. There you go, yeah. Hey, I hold on. So that's that's it. Any, I got any questions from you? Sorry. I understood that they tried to get a 20 foot width to the road and when you're going through mountainous um, areas like we have here in Montana. I wonder what percentage of the road they were able to achieve that you mentioned. I, I have never seen anything in a side cut situation that was really much wider than a wagon. I think that it seems to me years ago, I read that like when they were going through timber, they would try to get 20 foot or more so that they could have light through there, if nothing else, you know, 
and make it a little more, you know, use, you know, so, I mean, when you start going to where if you've got a six and a half foot wide wagon and you've got seven feet between trees, you know. 20 foot was something that was ideal, but in this country probably not common. Well, well, like I say, is that coming through the Missoula Valley, there was no width at all. It was just a driven wagon. Yeah. Yeah. Sir, I was surprised to see the shot you had of a cut that they actually did. I'm curious, what is what is the biggest cut that you've seen that they did? That one right there. Well, I, actually, there that that's a rock cut that I saw. If you go up on the big side cut above, the, there's there's very significant dirt you know, uh, dirt cuts up there. I don't know how much rock was cut up there, but that, up, they had 160 workers for six weeks on that stretch over the big side cut, which is what, a couple miles long, Jim? Yeah. Yes, sir. Cistern barometer? Yes. How, how does that work again? Barometric pressure. Yeah. When was that first available? Like, that ancient or early God, I, I've read this at one time. Maybe like the 1600s was when they first un started to understand the concept. This this particular type, if you look uh, in, um, you know, like Pike and trying to think of some of the other early explorers, they all have this cistern barometer. And they always break the damn thing because it's very fragile. They came in a leather case. Uh, and mine's broken. My, mine, I've got the piece of glass off the end and I've got the mercury, but I need to have it fixed. Yeah. Yes, Jim? Were, were Asians employed as the civilians or did that come later with railroads? I think just with the railroads. I don't think, I don't think there was the Asian populace at that point. And with the mines, yeah, yeah. Okay, any other question? One more. Did you ever make a, a list of where they had the observatories? I got six. Do you, do you have any other kind? No, I, you know, I think I picked up somewhere back to where they had done it, you know, that they did it in Hellgate, they did it in uh, Sohan's Pass, they did it in Walla Walla, they did it in Fort Benton. And beyond that, I think that I... St. Regis. St. Regis? Yeah. That would be funny if you came across any of them. Where at? Calvary Mission. Oh, okay. 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 Well, thank you. Yeah, I hope I hope it was good. <laughs> now, for our, for our last thing uh, of today, we have Kim Brigaman. I probably should find his bio here just to give him credit for what he is. Uh, Kim grew up in the Missoula area and has written for the Missoula New Missoulian newspaper for 34 years, most recently as a county government and history writer. The latter has spurred his interest research in numerous articles on the Mullen Road in early day western Montana. He's a past presenter at the Mullen Road conferences and was a contributor to the upcoming anthology, The Mullen Road Carving a Passage Through the Frontier Northwest by Paul D. McDermott, Ron O'Grimm, and Philip Mobley. So Kim, or some here somewhere. Uh, one thing to look at just is, while I'm thinking of it, is this, okay, for the bus thing tomorrow, you want to park in that kind of area that I kind of got squared, which is kind of an asphalt area up to the north of Joker's Wild, which is out here, next building up. Okay, thanks. We're right on time. It's 4:15. <laughs> it's good time. My job here is to be very quick and do it quickly. Um, my thought here for these last 15 minutes before we headed out um, is to give a kind of a contextual idea of what we're going to be looking at tomorrow on the bus trip. Um, before I do that, though, I, there will be some people that won't be here tonight that are here, and I, I would really like to recognize um, the people that have worked so hard <laughs> to put this thing on. And so I'm going to ask um, Marsha, would you stand up, please? <laughs> Marsha Porter from Missoula. 
Kay Strombo sitting over there by the door from Superior. Ruth Baker, I know you're there in the very back room, Ruth, from Stevensville. We've had a lot of, a lot of hard work being done by several individuals, and we didn't know what we were doing. So <laughs> we're, we're hoping it all comes together. Most of you know that the Mullen Road was constructed in two sweeps. The first sweep was 1859 to 1860. Um, the winter, that winter was spent up at, up at Cantonment, Jordan, by De Borgia, um, what, 15 miles up the, up the St. Regis River from St. Regis, somewhere in that, in that order. The second sweep um, also started in Walla Walla in 1861 and concluded, um, well, it essentially concluded at uh, what's now Bonner, Milltown, in, in uh, May of 1862. There was a, um, a number of purposes for the second sweep. One, one main purpose, one main uh, goal was to throw the road to the north of Lake Coeur d'Alene instead of the south. In other words, through Spokane, um, and that was a, a major change in the in the route. Another need on that second sweep was to try to address all those crossings over the Coeur d'Alene and uh, the St. Regis River on on this side. Um, I don't think that was ever successfully done, but they spent a lot of time doing that. And the third major topic um, or major issue that Mullen wanted to get completed was building a bridge over the Blackfoot, the big Blackfoot River to, so he would, could keep the road on the north side of the Clark Fork River all the way from St. Regis where they crossed with a ferry all the way to, uh, to Medicine Tree Hill. Tomorrow then our plan is to kind of investigate um, the uh, that second sweep, uh, that will be kind of our focus. And so we'll get a chance to see where Cantonment Wright was, was um, established in November of 1861 and was finally abandoned in May of 1862. In one of, um, one of the coldest re winters on record, and I know you hear that all the time, the coldest winter on record. Um, I think Bill Young's, uh, some students at, at Eastern Washington have posted a, a treatise on the winter of 1861-62. It, it indeed was legendary, and they spent it on the cold, well, most of them spent it on the cold bluff where Milltown, Montana sits today. and. Um, why, why he said it there is, is a matter of debate that we can look at tomorrow. The, there's, um, it was pointed out to me earlier in the day that um, we tend to have a vocabulary uh, of place names, etc., that not everybody relates to. <laughs> and so when, I, when we're talking about some things that we're going to east of Missoula tomorrow, um, these are names that you, you won't be familiar with or you may not be familiar with. Um, I've got a couple of them written down here. Um, we're talking Tura, Tura Peak. That's the mountainside that um, Three Mile Grade will be on, which is, um, what, three or four miles east of Bonner, right, along, right alongside the interstate. All this is right alongside the interstate. That's one of the major themes of this trip tomorrow will be to see in this fairly narrow river valley how much um, we have changed the river. The river channels have been changed immensely by the railroads, by the, by the highways, et cetera. And, and it'll be clearly visible to, to, to us tomorrow. Um, so we got, you keep hearing three mile, three mile grade, three mile grade, I think a couple of presenters have had that Sohan sketch of three mile grade. That was, um, that was a major work project in the winter of 1861-62. It was set at um, one of four winter camps that John Mullen established 
in addition to cantonment right at the conjunct at the confluence of the Big Blackfoot and the Hellgate Rivers. So we have the main bridge building crew there at the confluence in cantonment right, but four other camps upriver um, as far as about 30 miles upriver, well, 25 miles upriver, where mountain cuts, side cuts were made to avoid those river crossings that, that Bill just showed us on that one map. Um, it, there were 11, in, in 1860, the, the first sweep in 1859, 1860, there were 11 river crossings that he did nothing about between here and Medicine Tree Hill, Hill, another one of those vocabulary terms, Medicine Tree Hill, that, which is going to be our terminus tomorrow where we turn around. But um, he built four, f four or five um, side cuts, went up on the mountain, in other words, to avoid river crossings that uh, uh, avoided all but one river crossing. And finally built a bridge at the base of Medicine Tree Hill, which was the only time, the only crossing of the Hellgate River um, from clear down at St. Regis. They, he kept it on the north bank all the way up to Medicine Tree Hill, which is 30 miles um, east of Bonner, or east of Missoula. So um, that, that was a major project, not only to build the, the Blackfoot Bridge in that cold, cold winter, but also to, uh, to make these side cuts. And that's what we're going to be looking at tomorrow. Um, we'll be stopping at Beaver Tail Hill. We'll be stopping at Rocky Point, one of Sohan's favorite um, sketches. And I think it's going to be on, Dan says it's going to be on the cover of the book, this, the sketch of Rocky Point, which is, is at near the Rock Creek Interchange. Um, what else we got? Oh, uh, Kendall Creek is the, the eastern end of uh, Three Mile Grade. Um, it's, Kendall Creek is the first major drainage um, upriver from the Blackfoot. And it's about five, five, six miles. First, what became of the Mullen well, it's now the Mullen Road Conference. It was Mullen Day. At that time, it was uh, a special day to um, commemorate the movement of the Mullen Monument in St. Regis by the St. Regis Community Council. Community Council. Yeah, it was the centennial, and the governor was there. Oh. It was the centennial in, well, yeah, Montana Centennial in 1989. That is 25 years ago. And um, they have sustained, they sustained this event and helped grow it to what it is today. Um, the old Mullen Day um, celebrations, commemorations occurred someplace in Mineral County. And for, 10 years. for 16 years until 2006. And then, and then uh, it went on down the road to, to Helena. But we have a, a certificate of appreciation for the Mineral County Historical Society, in, represented tonight by Kay Strombo and Glenn Kepke, and I, I'll read it to them. This, this certificate is presented to the Mineral County Historical Society for 25 years of service dedicated to preserving the history of the Mullen Road. Your tireless efforts, commitment, and ongoing research ensures the future preservation of the history of the Mullen Road. Presented May 3rd, 2014, by the 2014 Mullen Road Conference Committee, Missoula, Montana. If it weren't for these folks, we wouldn't be here tonight. Thank you. And that was Marsha's idea, by the way. <laughs> Marsha Porter, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a door prize. <laughs> Our speaker tonight has been waiting about a half hour longer than he thought he'd have to wait, but we are really excited to have Keith Peterson here with us tonight, and I really mean that. When I first started getting involved in this not very many years ago, 
I thought, the first thing I thought was, well, somebody needs to do the undaunted courage version of the Mullen Road, the Stephen Ambrose, Lewis and Clark thing, um, a blow by blow, you know, every, every angle you can think of, of the expedition, the road building expedition. And I also thought somebody needs to do John Mullen's life. Well, we got the Bible now, and it's still sizzling off the press uh, from Washington State University um, Press, which, uh, as I understand, Keith, you picked up the first box full yesterday in Pullman, correct? So, and, and they are marvelous. Believe me, I got a chance to look at a proof, and it is, it's going to be a reference book for Mullenites um, from now on. I mean, this is the Bible in terms of John Mullen's life. And um, <laughs> Keith is the Idaho State historian. Just a second, got to find my cheat sheet. <laughs> you want to introduce <laughs> He's, he's uh, I've got the wrong sheet. That's what you're going to talk about. Okay, Idaho State Historian and the Associate Director of the Idaho State Historical Society. He, he made a beeline here from Boise where he filled in for the head director for the last two weeks, as I understand it. A frequent public speaker, he's the author of numerous articles and books about Idaho and the Northwest. He's the only person to have twice received the Idaho Book Award, the outstanding book on Idaho. He also received the first annual award for outstanding achievement in the humanities from the Idaho Humanities Council in 1986, the presidential medallion from Lewis and Clark, Lewis Clark State College in 2006, and an honorary doctorate from the University of Idaho in 2014. Must have just happened. <laughs> Next week. <laughs> uh, we are very pleased to have Keith Peterson here. Thanks, Keith. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm, I'm a little nervous because my cousin came from Helen and my cousin Joyce, who is here, and I know that reports are going to go out to the family. So um, wh whether I do well or not, just let Joyce know that you thought I did an outstanding job. So that it really is a pleasure to be here. I, May is Archaeology and Historic Preservation Month at the, in, in Idaho. And uh, consequently, I am always on the road. So I, um, the last time I was able to attend one of these conferences was at Fort Benton in 2010. So it's a real pleasure to be here. And Kim, thanks for the nice introduction. There are a lot of people in this room who I'd like to thank who were with me over many years of writing this book. But I'm, I'm only going to mention a few. Uh, Ken Robison, thanks for all of your um, all of your advice and for the photographs. Uh, Dan McDermott, uh, thank you for I can't imagine how many email conversations we had arguing about John Mullen, but especially thanks for your help in allowing me to better understand the really long and close relationship between Gus Sohan and uh, and John Mullen. And Kay Strombo and Bob Dunsmore, who's at this table, um, waded their way through the book when it was very much in draft form. Hopefully it's better now. It's largely better because of their, of their advice. So thank you both very much for that. Um, it's a real pleasure to be at a conference that is sponsored by the State Humanities Council. I'm a big fan of State Humanities Councils. You do outstanding work. Um, indeed, the Idaho Humanities Council provided a research fellowship to me, which allowed me to get to the lot, a lot of the places that I'm going to talk about uh, tonight. As Kim mentioned, I picked up the book yesterday. I've kind of looked at it. I can guarantee you there are no upside down pages. So um, with that, uh, I would recommend that you definitely buy a copy or multiple copies. Uh, it's the world premiere here tonight. Um, uh, besides, I don't want to cart them all the way back to Washington State University Press. Um, so I, it's an incredible book. I'm sure you will agree. So you'll want to get copies. Um, and I'll be happy to autograph copies. I'll stay around as long as you want. Of course, you have to understand that as soon as I autograph it, the value goes down 50%. But <laughs> Tonight, 
I am going to do my PowerPoint now. I have to do this with one hand. Tonight, the purpose of tonight is to get from this guy, who you probably all recognize as the young Army lieutenant who built a road near us, to get him until he became this guy nearly a half a century later, a man who we really don't know an awful lot about. So that's our purpose. Um, I live in, uh, I work in Idaho, but I live just across the state line in Washington. So to get here, I crossed three states. Um, John Mullen would have been pleased with my route because I did most of it on Interstate 90, which as we all know from today is the, and we all knew anyway, the most recent iteration of the Mullen Road. But had John Mullen had his way with the United States Congress, we would now be meeting in Missoula, a town in eastern Washington. And we'll get into that uh, a little bit later. But it's great to be in Missoula, even though I had to travel through three states to get here, because this is the hometown of Addison Howard, who was the first biographer of John Mullen. And you can find her papers just across town at the University of Montana archives. And if you look in there, you'll find some very interesting correspondence between Addison Howard and Mae Mullen, who was John's youngest daughter, who really encouraged Addison to write the first biography of her dad and congratulated her when that article appeared in the Washington Historical Quarterly in 1934. The University of Montana archives was one of more than 30 places where my wife, who is uh, also a historian, um, having two historians in one family has many advantages. Being able to pay the mortgage is not one of them, but um, we, are, we do make good traveling companions. A very fine historian and an overly qualified uh, research assistant on this trip who could not be here because she decided it was more important to be with our grandson in London than being in Missoula at a Mullen Road conference. So you go figure. I can't. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense to me. But we found uh, records trying to piece together the John Mullen story literally from coast to coast. I think it's because of the work of Addison Howard that those of you who live in Missoula know more about John Mullen than do the people in Bozeman. Um, the university website of that other university that will remain unnamed, Bob Dunsmore is the one who pointed this out to me, on that campus they have a, uh, a, a residence hall called Mullen Hall and the university website provides us the history on Mullen Hall and how it got its name. It was named for John Mullen, so far so good a lieutenant in the Lewis and Clark expedition. <laughs> well, although the university eventually corrected the website, I think that the lesson here is clear. If you can't get your own university history correct, you're probably going to have a hard time on the football field against the University of Montana. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that story also symbolizes... <laughs> But that story also symbolizes to me the fact that really we don't know a lot about John Mullen. And tonight I want to tell you about some of the places that we visited and some of the stories that we found to try to piece together the, the life, particularly the life after his life after the road, which really has been a bit of a mystery and, and partly because papers that allowed us to uh, do the research in, the, in that uh, part of his life only became available fairly recently. But first, I have to make a confession tonight um, to this group particularly. There was a time when I was not obsessed with John Mullen. Um, if I'm honest, I have to admit that most of my life I was fairly normal um, and only mildly interested in the man. And my wife kind of hopes those days might return. Um, so how did this obsession with John Mullen begin? So far as I can recollect, the first I'd ever heard of John Mullen was in an undergraduate history class at Washington State University in 1970 about Northwest history, and I heard about the Mullen Road and its significance, and I was immediately attracted to the story, and I would find myself as I was driving out away from campus on weekends around the inland Northwest finding lots of reminders of the story. I mean, you all know they're not hard to find. We have more than two dozen massive stone monuments to the Mullen Road in three states. In addition to that, there are historical markers and interpretive signs. Uh, it might be 
it certainly is one, if not the most monumentalized uh, event in the American West. It's, it's worthy of a Civil War battlefield, I think, at times. I remember the exact moment that my curiosity about Mullen became a, an obsession, and it was on a winter night in 2007. I keep files, as all writers do, I guess, of potential writing projects. Ideas that strike me at the time as surely Pulitzer Prize winning books that haven't turned out that way yet. But uh, nonetheless, I keep a lot of files. And in 2007, I w went to the file under John Mullen, and I realized pretty much to my surprise that it was growing pretty thick. And I also realized to my surprise that the first one was dated 1986. I'd been fascinated with this guy for, for quite a while. And on that night in 2007, looking at that kind of growing file, I went to my computer, and that's what touched off my obsession with John Mullen. Up until then, I'd always been pretty frustrated with John Mullen. On the one hand, it seemed like we knew a lot about this guy, especially those of us who live out here. I mean, m many of us live on or near the Mullen Road. We drive Interstate 90. We know of the town of Mullen. Uh, we know the various schools named after Mullen, the banks, the community parks, the real estate developments. Uh, we know of modern housing developments and mobile home courts, um, street names in, three s in cities in three states that have uh, Mullen's name. In my town, if you want to have a community event, you hire the Mullen Road Band. And as a historian, I also recognize that almost every book, a significant book of 19th century Northwest history, paid homage to the Mullen Road and its, and its significant role in the development of a very large region. But with all of this Mullen mania around us, I really still didn't understand who John Mullen was. He appears regularly in our history books, but only for a brief chronological period of time, and then he pretty much exits the written record. He makes his first appearance, as we all know, as a young lieutenant just out of West Point who joins Isaac Stevens' Pacific Railroad Survey of 1853-54 uh, to plot the course of a future transcontinental railroad. And as Isaac Stevens goes to Olympia to, become, to undertake his duties as the first territorial governor of Washington, he leaves Mullen behind in the Bitterroot Valley, and consequently he undertakes some of the most significant explorations in the American West trying to find a place to build a wagon road, because in those days a wagon road was a necessary precursor if you're going to get the supplies in to build, to build a railroad. Isaac Stevens was incredibly well connected in Washington, D.C. and in the Army, and so he made a very strong case that John Mullen should be the man who builds the road. And after a hiatus of a few years, when most articles about Mullen, if they mention anything about him at all during this period of time, say that he went to Florida to fight the Seminoles, which is erroneous, as I found out, but one of many myths that have developed about Mullen over the years. After that hiatus of a few years, he comes back and he builds the road. It was a remarkable achievement, um, as we all know. It was overseen by a young Army officer of drive and ambition, one of bulldog determination, uh, undertaken by a man who cottoned absolutely no criticism of his work, traits that would characterize Mullen his entire life. Though most books say that John Mullen built his road between 1859 and 1862, most of you in this room know that actually he hired his first road crew in the spring of 1858. And in fact, he was working on an existing road out of the Dalles to make improvements on that road to connect with his road in Walla Walla. And it, he was at that work camp on a, on a day in the spring when an army courier came up on a hard-ridden horse with shocking news. Confederated inland tribes had massacred all of 160 man uh, contingent sent out of Fort Walla Walla by Colonel Edward Steptoe. Well, the number of people killed turned out to be a gross exaggeration, but that was the first report that Mullen got. But there's not too much doubt that Edward Steptoe was almost uh, beat George Custer to the last stand. And immediately, the American press referred to the Army's defeat as Steptoe's disaster. What's almost always overlooked in this very well-known history uh, uh, event in Northwest history is that the Confederated Tribes of Inland Indians were not really after Colonel Edward Steptoe. He just happened to be in the way. Who they really wanted to get was John Mullen and his road-building crew. And the resulting War of 1858 was largely fought over John Mullen's Road. 
Isaac Stevens had signed treaties with the inland tribes in 1855 to cede land in what is now eastern Washington state so that the federal government could build a road through that, through that country, the road that eventually became John Mullen's Road. But the Senate had not ratified that treaty. And the Indians were well aware of Mullen's plans to build the road anyway. In fact, they were watching him as he was building the road out of, out of uh, the Dalles. And they rightly, rightfully considered the road to be a trespass, one that would forever change their way of life. A few days after the battle, Colonel Steptoe wrote to his superior officer, putting the episode in, in perspective, a perspective that has kind of glanced over, uh, been glanced over by most historians. But it's a perspective that places the Mullen Road at the center of the hostilities. The fight with my command only committed the Indians to hostilities a little earlier, and probably under more fortunate circumstances to us. The Coeur d'Alene's and Spokane's had bound themselves to massacre any party that should attempt to make a road survey. I make no question that Lieutenant Mullen's party has been saved from destruction. Mullen himself concurred. He wrote a couple days later to Steptoe, your encounter with the Indians has saved my party from disaster, probably from a complete massacre. The army immediately sought revenge, and Lieutenant Mullen, unable to build his road because of the hostilities in, in the inland northwest, volunteered to jo join Colonel George Wright's um, uh, command to seek revenge for the uh, uh, Steptoe's disaster. The only part of the road that John Mullen had not been able to scout yet was that part through what is now eastern Washington state, which is exactly where George Wright was going to go. John Mullen signed up not so much to fight Indians, but rather to scout the future course of his road. That entire Wright campaign, often considered by military historians to be the most successful army campaign of the 1850s, was really fought for two reasons, to avenge Steptoe's defeat and to completely pacify the Indians so that John Mullen could build his road. Mullen was placed in charge of a group of 30 Nez Perce allies who served as scouts for Mullen. And Mullen and the Nez Perce were the first, among the first, to draw any fire at the very first battle, the Battle of Four Lakes, not too far from today's Spokane. Despite, and just think about this, this guy was just in a battle. Think of the huge adrenaline rush that he must have had. The next day he penned his field notes, those awful penmanship field notes that are hard to read about, we've heard a lot about today. And he spent almost all of his time discussing the future side of his road and the information he'd been able to gather to that. My party of assistants and I have been able to collect material for a complete map of the country from Fort Dowles to this point. I mean, this is really boring. This guy was just in battle. Only after doing this does he briefly note that we, quote, met the enemy and, quote, drove him from the ground. Well, I mean, it's a peculiar personality that will first write about the previous week's odometer readings before they write about the previous day's life-threatening battle. But it was typical of Mullen, who once he was on a job, he became obsessed to it, almost to the exclusion of everything else. I mean, let's face it, he was, in fact, the first Mullenite. So <laughs> despite seemingly insurmountable odds, harsh winters, unforgiving landscapes, high-priced labor. Um, when Mullen was um, able to get out on the road, um, he persevered in his, in his construction. He once wrote a quote that we heard today uh, from a dismal winter camp when things were not going well. As I was ordered to construct a road, it will be constructed. It's that perseverance that we commemorate at conferences like this, and it's that accomplishment of building that road that has fascinated generations of Northwesterners. But what about John Mullen himself? He exits Northwest history as a very young 32-year-old Army officer. The few biographical accounts that do exist about him hardly ever mention his life after 1862, and yet Mullen died in 1909, just about the time the first automobiles were starting to make their way over his road. He lived in an era of immense change. Surely, I thought, as I was putting all of those pieces and papers over all those years into the folder, there must be a story here. But I was frustrated because there just never seemed to be enough to get a handle on. We knew a lot about John Mullen, the road builder, but I could find virtually nothing about the other John Mullen, the rest of him. 
Well, in 2007, I'd been gathering those pieces of paper about John Mullen for a little over two decades. I knew of places where pieces of the story were hold. I knew of the wonderful work that the Mineral County Historical Society uh, has been doing since the 1980s to gather information to preserve the story of the road. But again, it just didn't seem like there was enough here to, to pull together a, a true biography. Well, back to that winter night in 2007 when my obsession began. I went to the computer and I got on a website called WorldCat, which is a fascinating site if you've not seen it. The world's largest library catalog, as its banner headline proclaims, literally the world's records repositories at your fingertips. And on that winter night, I typed in John Mullen as I had in the past. But this time, something pretty remarkable immediately to the, jumped to the top of the, of the search. I read that Georgetown University Archives in Washington, D.C. held, quote, the John Mullen papers um, containing documents generated and collected by Mullen, 1830 to 1909, pioneer, military engineer, and attorney, best known for constructing the Mullen Road in the American West, stored in 13 archival boxes. Wow. This was my eureka moment. <laughs> This is the moment my wife wishes had never happened. <laughs> I immediately emailed the archivist there and got a list, uh, a, a more a thorough list of what was in the papers. And then I started emailing every archives in the country I could think of that had any connection with Mullen or the Mullen Road or any of the dozens of fascinating who's who of 19th century America who John Mullen's path crossed. And what I was able to discover after doing research in all those repositories is that completing the Mullen Road was just one of many interesting episodes in John Mullen's long life. John Mullen chased a dream of getting rich, literally from coast to coast, and he made it. He lived for a time in the highest echelons of high society in the nation's capital. But he ultimately died a man broken in spirit and bankrupted in finances. His was a true roller coaster of a life. But I knew none of that on that winter night in 2007 when WorldCat pointed me in the direction of an obsession. But I think we should probably pause here now because I think there's some of you who are not paying attention to the speaker because you're wondering, how in the hell did Georgetown University get the John Mullen papers? <laughs> well, here's what happened. John Mullen died in 1909, and he left to his daughter May all of his possessions, which didn't amount to much, but did amount to these boxes of papers, which May preserved. May had a vision that one day the world would come to recognize the accomplishments of her father. That was the reason she had encouraged the young Addison Howard back in the 20s and 30s to write the biography. But for whatever reason, maybe Addison wasn't interested enough. Maybe May didn't make an offer. Maybe it was too expensive to get to DC. I don't know. But Addison Howard made no use of those papers, with the exception of the journal that uh, John's wife, uh, it, it's not really a journal, a, a reminiscence that John's wife wrote in 1892, which is kind of unfortunate because it has lots of truth to it, but lots of places where she's kind of um, um, over the line of the truth, I guess you would say. Well, unlike her father, May not only got rich, but also remained rich. She lived in a beautiful Georgetown home next door to, quote, that nice young couple who always had the photographers around, as she told a descendant who I interviewed a few years ago. That nice young couple's names were Jack and Jackie Kennedy. It was a very nice neighborhood indeed. The Mullins, like the Kennedys, were very Catholic, so when she died in 1962, it made perfect sense for May Mullen to leave the bulk of her $1.5 million estate to Georgetown University, a Jesuit institution. She did so, as the deed states, in honor of her father and his close relationship to a man who you all know, Father Pierre de Schmidt. May also left to the school her Georgetown home and all of its contents, including the papers that she had carefully preserved uh, for all of those years. So the papers, that part of the donation, went to the Georgetown University archives where they sat and sat. I'm convinced that the archivist at Georgetown really had no concept of the value of these papers to those of us living in the West. Finally, nearly a century after John's death and more than four decades after May had donated them, the papers were processed and Georgetown University Archives sent notice out to WorldCat. 
Well, some researchers like Dan had been in the papers before Mary and I got there, but we were the first ones to sit with that collection page by page, box by box, going through every piece of paper. I mean, you do have to be obsessed to do something like this, but you also have to remember that historians live with limited expectations about exciting lives. <laughs> and that doesn't get much more exciting to a historian than to be the first person to go through a major research collection. In that excursion to the East Coast, we not only stopped by several days George at Georgetown, we spent several days at the National Archives. We spent time at the Smithsonian Institution where you can find John Mullen's rather cantankerous letters uh, dealing with various aspects of his, the scientists who are on his expedition. We talked to Mullen relatives. We spent a few days doing research in the Isaac Stevens papers at Yale. We subjected our rental car to extreme security checks so we could do research at West Point. It was all very exciting. But sometimes as historians we get too fascinated, too attached to paper. We forget to look around us because often there's no finer historical uh, resource than a landscape. That's what makes the field trips that are always associated with this conference so, so valuable. There are things you can learn when you're on the ground that you just can't learn from a piece of paper. And that experience struck me when Mary and I spent a, a, a fine day in Annapolis, John's hometown. We'd made arrangements for the city historian to meet us and to guide us around the ancient part of uh, Annapolis as John would have seen it. Uh, and, and she did a fine job. It was a great day. The Mullen home no longer exists, but she was very eager to show us where it was. It was a modest home where the large family, uh, Mullen family, lived in very cramped quarters. But it was here, walking around that neighborhood, where a revelation struck me that's been key to me understanding John Mullen. Surrounding the small Mullen home are three huge mansions. One was built by a signer of the Declaration of Independence. One served as Thomas Jefferson's inspiration for Monticello. Um, the juxtaposition between these stately homes, some of the finest houses in America, and the Mullins' own modest house could not be stronger. It was the house, the Mullins' house was located on a street that John's father once complained, during rain uh, is flooded with filth of all kind. Well, that juxtaposition just really could not have been more stark. And it was while walking along those streets that it struck me that L Mullins' lifelong aspiration to get rich, to be like his neighbors, sometimes skirting ethical and legal barriers to do so, began right here. Building a road in the West was not his end game. It was instead a way of building a reputation so that he could gain both fame and fortune. When Mullen completed his road, he received a promotion to captain, and he went to Washington, D.C. to complete his road report for the Army. Much to the consternation of his superior officers, as he often did, he became very involved in politics in Washington, D.C. in that interesting winter of 1862-63. In the Abraham Lincoln Papers, which uh, Dan helped me uh, go through because I'd missed some things there the first time through, in, in the, pa the Abraham Lincoln Papers, the presidential papers at the National Archives, you can find a letter that John Mullen wrote to President Lincoln on March 4th, 1863, the day that Lincoln signed the act creating Idaho Territory asking to be appointed governor of Idaho Territory. Idaho, which at that point included all of Montana and virtually all of Wyoming, and I want you to know we're working now to get that property back. Um, Idaho, as we heard today, was born of the Civil War. For a variety of reasons, Congress, the 37th Congress, knew when it came into session that year that it was going to form a new territory in the West. The Congress was a little bit busy with the war and really didn't have much time to think about what the boundaries of that territory would look like. So the chair of the House Committee on Territories, James Ashley, who we heard a lot about today, asked John Mullen, a man who knew this area better than anyone in D.C. that winter, no voting member of Congress had ever been here, had no clue about the land that they were talking about, asked John Mullen to draw a map of what the Western Territory should look like. PowerPoint 2. This is John Mullen's map. And you can see one of the things that's, and I won't get into this too much because it's, it's kind of complicated. 
Congress at this time really wanted rectangular shaped territories and states. And if you look at a map of the West, if you throw out the two anomalies of Texas and California, which came into the Union kind of different than every place else, you're going to see a bunch of rectangles until you come to Idaho. Idaho is a very peculiarly shaped state. Mullen's map made exquisite sense. It, it made, as, as we know, who, who live here, the, the natural way to travel is east-west, not north-south. Mullen included the panhandle and west part of western Montana, including where we are today, in the territory of Washington. Everything to the south and to the east, he lumped into a new territory that from the very first, his first map, he called Montana. It was only later that the name Idaho came. He had every reason to believe that Congress would pass his vision of the West. And on February 12, 1863, the United States House of Representatives easily passed the bill that included Mullen's vision for the West. It's, Im it's important to recognize that one house, of the United States Congress, passed a bill that would have given us a complete different look for the West. But unbeknownst to John Mullen, Washington Territory's non-voting delegate to Congress, William Wallace, was quietly working with the Senate on quite a different look for the West. In, in, Mullins, in Wallace's map, uh, the eastern border of Washington is exactly where it is today. And Wallace, in a surprise move, introduced his bill into the Senate on the last day of the 37th Congress, March 3rd, 1863. If Congress was going to act, and these days I have to say Congress actually adjourned, um, but anyhow, if Congress was going to act to get a new territory in the West, it would have to act before midnight on, on March 3rd. And in a nutshell, the House of Representatives caved to the Senate. To me, as the Idaho State historian, it's a little different story for people in Montana. It was the most critical decision ever made in Idaho history, and I don't have any qualms about saying that. It established geographical, political, and cultural barriers in Idaho that made no sense and that we have been trying to struggle with for 150 years. In 1864, Congress came back and carved even more deeply into Idaho to create Montana, leaving Idaho with that isolated and awkward-looking panhandle, which has literally been a difficult nut to crack for Idaho for 150 years. Well, despite the fact that, in my opinion, the West would have been much better served if Mullen had won the battle of the dueling maps, the fact is he'd been completely outmaneuvered by William Wallace. And William Wallace also wanted to be governor of the territory. Lincoln ignored Mullen's request, despite the inc incredible number of members of Congress who supported uh, Mullen's uh, request to be territorial governor and instead appointed William Wallace. Mullen promptly resigned from the Army, and historians have speculated about why he did so at a time when West Point graduates were in much demand and, and getting rapid promotions during the Civil War. Most have concluded that Mullen was conflicted about the Civil War, having been born in Virginia and, and raised in Maryland. But Mullen um, considered his Army buddies who resigned from the Army to serve in the Confederate forces to be traitors. And he called secession a fraud upon which will sink its perpetrators and its abettors into eternal infamy. Other historians have speculated that John Mullen was upset because he'd been snubbed by President Lincoln. But the Mullen papers at Georgetown show a different story. We don't have to speculate any longer. Mary and I were opening files late in an afternoon after a long day of trying to decipher John Mullen's penmanship. He had to pass a penmanship class at West Point to get out of there. How he did it, I don't know. But we chanced across a fragile diary written in a very different hand, that of a young woman very much in love, to my knowledge, a diary that had only been seen by three people, the woman who wrote it, her daughter, and the archivist who processed the papers. It was the 1859 diary of Rebecca Williamson of Baltimore, four years later to become Rebecca Mullen, a diary written as if addressed to her future husband, but one that she didn't ever intend to show to him, and I'm sure would have been embarrassed if he had seen. When B John left Baltimore in 1859 to come out and once again start his road project, Rebecca started writing her diary and immediately mourned his absence. When you parted, my best beloved friend, you can form but a slight idea of the emotion that stirred my very soul. And in this diary, Rebecca envisioned their future together, and it is apparent that she had reservations about a decision that John had already made 
to leave the Army once he had completed his road. This is a phrase that Army recruiters probably don't want to hear, but she said, in the Army, you can always maintain your position as a gentleman, and you have leisure to devote to those pursuits from which you derive so much pleasure. So stay in the Army. It's a good deal. You can do whatever you want, but, you, but we have a steady income. As early as 1859, John had revealed to Rebecca that at the appropriate time, with his reputation as a road builder firmly in hand, he would resign from the Army and pursue the financial standing that he had always coveted. His resignation from the Army had nothing to do with Confederate sympathies or with presidential snubs. He just wanted to get rich. The opportunity to resign and hopefully get rich came in the spring of 1863 when a group of capitalists encouraged John Mullen to return to Walla Walla as a civilian to head up a venture to build a short-line railroad from the Columbia River to the beginning of his road in Walla Walla. It seemed the opportunity that John Mullen had long sought but his life almost immediately began to spin out of control. John was never able to convince enough investors of the merits of the railroad to make it a success, and, and the effort rather quickly failed. Still, it hadn't taken much convincing to get John back to Walla Walla. He had purchased business property in town before he left in 1862 after completing his road. He fully intended to return and grow rich with the city that was booming because of his road for two decades. Walla Walla was the busy, biggest and most prosperous city in Washington Territory because of its location on the Mullen Road. So while we talk about whether or not the Mullen Road was a success, if you were a business person in Walla Walla between 1862 and the mid-1880s, you had no question that this was a successful highway. John would have been willing to make a brief hiatus to Idaho to serve as territorial governor, further burnishing his reputation but he believed that his future lay in Walla Walla. I discovered that the story of what went so wrong in Walla Walla lay not in Georgetown, but in another archives clear across the country. So the search for John Mullen now moved west. A review of court records at the Washington State Archives in Cheney quickly revealed how rapidly Mullen's dream of Walla Walla prosperity crumbled. John brought three younger brothers into his various business schemes, which in addition to the railroad included a farm, a stage line, a livery, and a sawmill. And though the family had seemed closely knit when living in that small Annapolis home, the potential for economic gain soon brought the relationship cutthroat competition. John soon realized that two of his younger brothers were scheming against him, and things became very ugly with literally brother suing brother. John could not pay the debts that had been accumulated by his brothers. At the same time, his brother Lewis was plotting to take away the family farm. And remarkably, even though Lewis had never put a dime into the family business, he was able to take part of the farm away from John. John and Rebecca hobbled out of Walla Walla without a farm and completely bankrupt. Like so many others in American history, um, were seeking a fresh start. They next set their sights on California. So our trail in search of John Mullen took us next to Chico State University, where the papers of John Bidwell are housed. John Bidwell was, in the 1860s, one of California's wealthiest people, uh, the owner of one of its largest ranches. He platted the town of Chico and gave away free city lots just so people would come to work on his huge Rancho Chico. The Bidwell Mansion is now a, a state museum. Well, you can see why John Mullen would be attracted to such a guy. I mean, he always, he always uh, coveted wealth. Leaving the Northwest in 1862 after building his road, he'd actually ridden by Rancho Chico, and he left a rather exuberant description, which is in the museum, the Bidwell Museum. When the day we were there, we asked the, the docents and the staff member who was there, what do you know about John Mullen? Mm, not much. <laughs> but they do have this really nice quote from him. This is only a part of it, but he says, the center of this large estate is the beautiful village of Chico, where live an educated and contented peasantry, all more or less supported by the means of this bachelor millionaire whose residence is an architectural gem. You can just see Mullen. He, that's what he wanted to be. Mullen didn't meet Bidwell on that trip, but their paths crossed in 1865 when the millionaire Bidwell, who was then a member of Congress, and the bankrupt Mullen both set their eyes simultaneously on the Boise Basin then teeming with miners needing provisioning. Both independently came to the conclusion that if they could construct a stage and freight line out of Chico, 
they could do very well by provisioning the miners. And for Bidwell, it would serve as a place to, uh, to send a lot of his produce from the huge Rancho Chico. Well, Mullen had learned his way around the Washington bureaucracy from his mentor, Isaac Stevens. And he spent much time in Washington, D.C. in 1865 lobbying for a mail contract, which was almost always essential to the success of a stage and freight line to have the, the government subsidy. And he was successful in getting a $75,000 mail contract for the line uh, from Chico. Bidwell, as I mentioned, was then in Congress, was also working for a mail contract, although not in partnership with Mullen. But Bidwell, powerful and influential though he was, soon discovered something that many others learned about John Mullen. Once Mullen set his mind to something, he relentlessly pursued it. The Bidwell papers and Chico are full of the wealthy congressman's regrets about being forced into a partnership with Mullen, but also being virtually powerless to do anything about it. Mullen edged himself in continually so that I could not strike anywhere without hitting him, Bidwell wrote in exasperation. But Bidwell could not shake Mullen, and Mullen characteristically put everything into the Chico line, which now became a reluctant partnership with Bidwell. A local newspaper called Mullen an, inexhaust an inexhaustible small steam engine. But try as he might, he could not make the road a success. Disenchanted with his forced partnership with, with Mullen, Bidwell never put any real money into it. And in 1866, John Mullen went bankrupt again. For the next episode in Mullen's, Mullen's career, we traveled south to the Bancroft Library at Berkeley and to the California Historical Society. And I supplemented this with a really neat search engine called Chronicling of America, the Library of Congress's newspaper digitization project. Just enter in a name, a, uh, a person, an event, and you have instant access to hundreds of newspapers, something that was impossible for historians and something I'm convinced is going to completely change the craft of what we as historians do. In the old days, you used to go through one paper, one page at a time, or microfilm reels. Now you can get access to hundreds. And I immediately got access to dozens of papers about, uh, about John Mullen. And in these California repositories and in those digitized newspapers, I discovered how it was that John Mullen rose Phoenix-like from his two bankruptcies in Walla Walla and Chico. Mullen moved to San Francisco and he read law. He opened a law firm with a partner named Frederick Hyde and prospered by working the darkest corners of California land law, a young state whose loose laws were ripe for speculation. And Mullen and Hyde took full advantage, engaging in a practice that finally brought Mullen the prosperity he had always coveted but at the risk of his carefully honed road building reputation. California was then dispensing with thousands of acres of public land with no agency to oversee it, and California fell into you know, free-for-all, money-grubbing chaos, basically. And Mullen and Hyde were at the center of the firestorm, becoming one of the largest land speculating firms in California, amassing dubious, under dubious circumstances, probably not illegal, but ethics aside, amassing thousands of acres of public lands at ridiculously low cost that they then sold at a very good, nice profit. A clerk in the land office once referred to John as the notorious Captain John Mullen. It's not quite the sheen that we in the Northwest have of the Army Lieutenant who built that splendid road. After land speculating for a few years, John Mullen moved on to what he thought would be an even more lucrative venture. He knew the law and he knew how to lobby. And for the next stage of his life in the 1870s, he set up a law office in Washington, D.C., and that's where he remained the rest of his life. It's a good thing that he quit land speculating when he did, because his former partner, Frederick Hyde, continued with the nefarious dealings that Mullen and Hyde had perfected and spent much of his time in federal prison. Mullen became a lobbyist for the states of California, Oregon, Nevada, and the territory of Washington, and he did remarkably good work for them, and he did it ethically and legally. Indeed, he was probably too successful. For years, Mullen worked for various cases, and it gets complicated, so I won't go into it, but various reasons that the federal government owed new states money. The states were so new, and the politicians so naive in many ways that they didn't even know to ask for this money until John Mullen pointed it out to them. And they said, sure, if you want to go get us some money, that's great. And he set up a fee of 20 to 25% of all that he would procure. Well, that worked really well, as long as the sums were relatively small and he kind of floated under the radar screen without anyone paying attention. 
But when he landed a million dollar contract for California, all of a sudden his fees became what the Republican press always called outrageous fees. John Mullen was a lifetime Democrat and he had the misfortune of landing his biggest federal payments to California at a time when Republicans were in the ascendancy. The legal case about whether or not the state should pay Mullen ground on for decades. Mullen, always thorough, never one to suffer criticism, wrote a 580 page book explaining why he was legally entitled to his fees. His case against California eventually went all the way to the state Supreme Court and eventually Mullen was at least partially vindicated but that happened after he died. Seeing how California had managed to bilk Mullen out of his lawful fees, Nevada and Oregon followed suit. And John Mullen never received many of the payments that were rightfully him for doing legal work that brought thousands and, and actually millions of dollars into western state coffers. But before California and the other states reneged on their payments, John Mullen had for a time lived the life that he had always dreamed. Do one of those digital newspaper searches of John Mullen in the 1880s and you'll find stories about the beautiful yellow dress that Rebecca wore uh, when the Mullins were invited by President Cleveland to his inaugural ball, about the Mullen family's extended travels to Europe, about the debutante coming out of the two Mullen daughters. But do a search for John Mullen 20 years later and you'll see how far he had fallen, about how now his debutante daughters are operating a laundry, trying to piece together a living for the family. John had left the West as a notorious land grubber. And when it came time to find allies to help him defend his claims to rightful fees, John Mullen found that he had precious few. He had long lost the tarnish of his road building reputation. Well, there have been other interesting searches, and I'm only going to uh, mention one more because Margaret Gorski was here today. I don't think she's here tonight, but I told her I would mention this one. Margaret is the president of the National Lewis and Clark Trail Heritage Foundation, so I said I'd throw in something about Lewis and Clark. On a winter day, winter camp 1861, John Owen sent John Mullen an invitation to come give a public lecture as a fundraiser for orphans. It's, I don't know how this worked. How many orphans were there in Montana in 1861? But nonetheless, Mullen rode out of camp on Christmas and went down to Fort Owen and gave a lecture on his, really his heroes, Lewis and Clark. And it was the first public lecture ever given in what became the state of Montana. And remarkably, that document was saved by John Owen and now is at the Montana Historical Society in Helena. Mullen suffered a stroke in the 1890s. He grew weak as a kitten, as he, as he wrote, but his mind remained strong. He continued to fight the states for the fees that were lawfully his, and he continued to work as an attorney, though never very lucratively. A writer for Sunset Magazine visited John in 1909. That was when that last photograph was taken, a few months before John died. Typically, that interview is full of the bragging that was so much a nature, a uh, part of John Mullen's nature, but it's also a very revealing article, perhaps the best ever written about him. His body has become enfeebled, wrote the interviewer, but his mind, still alert, went readily back the 50 odd years to the route through the wild that was his life work. Mullen's health took a sudden downturn in December 1909 and he died on December 28th. He was 79. The Sunset article, which actually appeared after his death, was his finest obituary. Capturing the personality of this proud man far better than the few uh, obituaries that ran about him, usually a, a paragraph or two, often jumbling his accomplishments. I have not yet found a paper in Washington, Oregon, or Idaho. Of course, a lot of our papers haven't been digitized yet, but I've yet to find a paper that made any account of his death. John had kind of been forgotten out here. That was going to change in a few years later, about 1916, when all of those monuments started going up. The few newspapers elsewhere that did write obituaries usually summarize Mullen's life, as I said, in about two or three paragraphs. Far more captivating are the stories that appear with them on those pages. An advertisement for the Royal Laundry, telephone number Madison 1959, ran, across, ran above Mullen's obituary in the Richmond, Virginia paper. The page with the Mullen death announcement in the San Francisco paper carried the banner headline, Aeroplanes Flight Marred by Lack of, sustainable, of, of, of Suitable Starting Field. 
A man who we remember as building a wagon road through Indian country had lived to the day of telephones and human flight. Well, I honestly didn't know when I began this multi-year writing venture if there would be enough for a biography that really detailed the life, both the ups and downs of this fascinating man, a man who was a real man and not just a caricature, a person who came into a region, built a road, and then somehow just mis disappeared. But the pieces of the puzzle continued to fall in archives, large and small, literally across the United States. And in my mind, at least, I think he's a fitting character for a biography. John Mullen was a brave man, an underappreciated leader of men, in my opinion, a significant explorer of the American West, a fine engineer, an incredibly meticulous and hardworking individual. But he was also an egotistical, unethical money grubber who went out of his way to garner publicity at the expense of others and who cottoned not one bit of criticism. But that's the nature of history. It usually is messy. Our heroes always have flaws. It's fitting that we pay respect to Mullen's accomplishments because they were considerable. But as we honor the road that we built, it's also good that we understand something about the road builder himself. John Mullen was a person with ample attributes and with many faults. He was in that sense like all of us because he was, after all, the first Mullenite. Thank you very much. You've been a very kind and patient audience.